Welcome back to The Last Days Book Club, where we are reading the book entitled Pioneers Together by Josephine Cunnington Edwards. This book is a biography of Roy F. Cottrell and his wife Mertie, who were both born in 1878 and led an exciting life of service and mission in the early days of the young and rapidly growing Seventh-day Adventist Church. In our last reading, we completed chapter 12, entitled Lengthening Chords, where Roy was chosen as the first superintendent of the rapidly increasing mission work in East China. At this time, they received news that his father had passed away, and they asked Mother Cottrell to move to China to live with them, which she gladly did. In his work, Roy had to accompany new arriving missionaries to the inland station of Yingshang, where they found a company of 14 believers awaiting baptism, which ceremony they had to conduct in the dark of night in a muddy river because of the anti-foreign feelings of hostility. Nevertheless, the baptism was successful, and from that humble beginning came over 100 local missionaries who took the word across that region. A few months later, there was an explosion of anti-foreign violence in Changsha, the city where the Cottrells had first served, and the mission station was looted and vandalized, and the mission family there, the Lades, had to flee, but made it back to Shanghai, distressed and terrorized. After a few weeks, the president of the Asiatic Division in a committee meeting, required Roy to return and rebuild the mission in that city. Despite his opposition, Roy had no choice, and they sent his mother back to California and set off for the interior once again. In Changsha, they were surprised to find that despite the violence and the vandalism, the anti-foreign disturbances seemed to have turned the city dwellers toward the gospel instead of against it. A bright new day was dawning, and the work and the mission grew, and the numbers increased. A new location had to be found, at least for homes for the missionaries. Roy found a beautiful property on a little island on the Siang River, which after much prayer, he purchased with his own funds since a committee meeting to approve or disapprove the sale was unable to be convened. Though he was castigated for this initiative at the next meeting, he was also lauded for the choice, and soon buildings were being erected, and the Cottrells moved to the new spot, and the mission continued to grow. However, within a short while, Roy developed jaundice and was seriously sick, unable to eat or work. He was returned to Shanghai, where he was treated and recovered to return to Changsha to continue the work. We pick up the story today with chapter 13, entitled, In War and in Peace. October 10th, 1911 was a memorable day for China. Yet on the surface, it did not seem unusual to begin with. Roy and Murty had arrived in Hankow and were spending a few hours in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Esther Miller, who were then living in a semi-Chinese flat located in the Russian concession of that city. Six doors away, a fire broke out in a tenement, and soon the fire department, together with numerous police officers, both Russian and Chinese, swarmed about the place. Presently, they saw a handcuffed man being dragged from the scene. At the moment, the cause of the disturbance appeared mysterious, but at length it was learned that the prisoner was a revolutionist, making flags, emblems, and bombs. One of the bombs had prematurely exploded, causing the fire, and thus revealing the subversive plot. The unfortunate victim was summarily executed, and Roy and Murty had witnessed the first act 
in the revolution that overthrew the Manchu dynasty, which had ruled or misruled China for 267 long years. But they were wholly unaware of what was really transpiring, all unconscious of the mighty drama being enacted. They embarked that evening on a river streamer for Changsha. It was several days before the big news reached them. Province after province was being turned over to the revolutionists, and the foreign residents of Changsha were notified to be on the alert. If fighting broke out in the city by night, a red light from the Standard Oil flagpole would be the signal. If by day, it would be a black ball. Days of suspense dragged on. Then early one Sunday morning, the black ball hanging from the pole gave the ominous warning. Foreigners in every state of dress and undress, carrying a few belongings, rushed out of the city. The island home of the Cotrells proved to be a haven for a number of them. Bishop Gilman of the Episcopal Mission brought his wife and children to their door. Good morning, Mr. Cotrell, he said anxiously. What can you do for us refugees? Do you have a place where we can bunk for a time? Roy was profoundly pleased now with his selection of a mission site. Their home was so newly finished that the paint on the floors was hardly dry. Yet he invited the distraught little family to come in. After a hurried consultation with Murty, he suggested that these friends occupy the living room. Soon, another knock came on their door. It proved to be four young bachelors from the Changsha branch of the Yale University who came dashing in with a similar request. Say, they greeted Roy, could you put us up anywhere? How would you like to stay in our attic, asked Roy, after thinking for a moment. Just any spot you can give us will be fine, they replied. There, in the storage place under the roof, they set up their folding cots and unpacked their few possessions, remaining there for many weeks. Friendships which lasted for many years were formed in this time of danger. One of the four, Kenneth Scott Latourette, later became the most erudite and distinguished Christian missionary historian of the 20th century. His masterpiece, A History of the Expansion of Christianity, in a set of seven volumes, is well known to scholars. During the tense time of waiting, he and Roy had many interesting and spirited discussions on historical and religious subjects. It was a pleasure to Roy to match wits with such a brilliant young scholar. The war was on in earnest, and mission work, if attempted at all, had to be done with extreme caution. Heavy fighting took place in the vicinity of Hankow, and bloody street battles raged in Changsha. Nearer still, brisk skirmishes occurred right on the riverfront near the mission cottages. Death lurked everywhere. It was dangerous to go out into the city for any purpose. As a matter of protection, the foreign businessmen built sandbag barricades with mounted guns on the shore of the island and lived in houseboats nearby. They too valued the protection of the island. The United States and Great Britain both dispatched gunboats to anchor in the little harbor. About half of the time, the frightened populace had their city gates closed. Even when they were open, those who entered did so at their own risk. One strange thing occurred. The queues that had been worn from generation to generation by the men of China as a token of submission to the Manchu rulers suddenly disappeared. How glad the men were to have the unsightly long tail of here cut off and gone forever. Throughout the country, unrest and uncertainty 
increased. Business was at a standstill, and an ominous portent of danger threatened everyone. Then came the consular order that all American and British women and children should leave the interior for safety at one of the port cities. It was a severe trial for Roy to see Murty go, for they had always been close together. Yet, it would have seemed more terrible to have her stay and endure the danger. Not long after Murty left Changsha, she wrote of her experiences to the folks at home. Returning home about midnight, we decided that it was best for me to go with the others. It was nearly 3 a.m. when my preparations completed. I took one last lingering look at the new homes which we had entered with such joy only one month before, and which we must now leave on the conditions of such great uncertainty. But of course the greatest trial was for me to leave my husband in Changsha, while I attempted to reach a place of safety. Nevertheless, as this seemed best, after an uttered prayer, the goodbyes were quickly said, and I found myself alone on the deck of the boat. I was watching with tear-dimmed eyes what otherwise might have been distinctly seen in the beautiful moonlight. Roy's little rowboat fading away in the distance, and then he was gone. She wrote much more, but of special interest was the account of her perilous stopover in Hankow. She said, as the sun lowered in the west, Canadin began in earnest. We sat out on the deck of the steamer and watched such animated and nerve-wracking fireworks as I trust I shall never again be compelled to behold. As the shadows deepened, we would see the distant flash, then hear the report, and a swish in the water near us would tell of a falling shell. Sometimes a whizzing through the ear, just over our heads, sent us all running into the salon, which in reality offered no protection. After an evening of this experience, we realized more than ever that our only safety lay in the hands of him whose business had led us to this far country amid such dangers. And with his promise, lo, I am with you always. And the sweet assurances of the 91st Psalm, we lay down to rest. Again, the truth of the saying, that God's promises, like the stars, shine brightest in the darkest night, was forcibly brought to mind, and we were glad to cast ourselves helplessly upon them. After a hectic journey, Murty arrived in Shanghai. Of course, the city was already teeming with refugees, new ones arriving by every boat and train. But she found accommodations in an apartment house with other missionary friends. Roy remained in Changsha to do what work he could and to encourage the native workers during this time of war and peril. About two months later, Roy received a letter from Elder W. A. Spicer, Secretary of the General Conference, urging him to leave Changsha immediately. The committee, said the letter, considered that an American remaining in China during times of turmoil was altogether too good a target for the bullet of an anti-foreign fanatic. Roy was more than glad to comply. In truth, the mission cottage was no longer home without the little wife he had learned to rely upon so much. Since their marriage ten years before, this was the longest time he and Murty had been separated from each other. While crossing the Tong Ting Lake on the way to Hankow, the steamer on which Roy was traveling was attacked by pirates or renegade soldiers. Bullets whizzed about, and it was amazing how quickly Roy acquired the technique of instantly dropping to a horizontal position on the deck. But the captain disregarded the attackers, steamed dead ahead, 
and soon outdistanced the marauding craft. Roy's heart seemed to run ahead of him, and time dragged by on leaden feet. But a few days later came the happy reunion at Shanghai, and with deep gratitude, Roy and Murty praised the Lord for his protecting care during the difficult days of their separation. They were not at leisure, however, during their temporary exile from their mission home. They helped in the preparation of much-needed literature and in other essential tasks. By early spring, things had quieted down to the point that Roy and Murty were able to return to their home in Changsha. They were prepared for all kinds of discouraging reports from the native workers left behind to hold the ropes. But the day after their arrival, Roy rushed home, his face glowing. Murty, you cannot guess. I, I think I can, she said. I can read things in your face. Roy was amused. What do I have in my face? He asked incredulously. That the work isn't nearly as bad off as we feared. Roy smiled at her intuition and insight. I thought you'd be surprised, he said. But you're right. We have evidence that while we were gone, unseen agencies were at work, helping our native believers. Just think, Bertie, in spite of all the turmoil and trouble, literature sales have reached a new high. Why, Murty, you should hear the glowing reports of the literature evangelists. That's marvelous, she exclaimed. And in these troubled times. Yes, Roy continued. And the splendid reports of Bible studies conducted. It must be true that hard and perilous times make the people more serious-minded. New groups of believers have actually been formed in several places. Because of this good news, it seemed imperative to visit these groups of newly won Christians to encourage them in the good way. So hardly were they settled until it was necessary to get out their traveling equipment again. It was a beautiful May day, and the preparations were complete. Their packed suitcases People could not travel in China as light then as they do now in the nylon age. Folded cots and rolls of bedding in canvas bags lay on their veranda. The cook, whose name was Mei Ai, beautiful jewel, announced that the big lunchbox, full to the brim with necessary and nourishing food for the journey, was ready to be locked. Ho Si Fu, the gatekeeper, had already gone into the city to find enough leather-skinned coolies to carry the baggage to the railway station. These thin, sturdy men skillfully suspended the 16 pieces of luggage to each end of the poles or yokes. Then they balanced them across their shoulders and braced their bodies to carry the weighty burden. Crossing from the island to the city by Sampan, they took up their loads again for the jog trot to the station located just outside the east city gate. Roy and Murty hurried to keep up with the fleet-footed coolies. At the depot, they were joined by Huang Dizen Deo, their former language teacher, who was developing into an efficient preacher. At last, the train came lumbering along from behind a protection in the imposing old city wall. Soldier guards, still in evidence of the political turmoil, were there in force. They clicked their heels and stood at attention. All kinds of bags, packages, and baskets cluttered the platform, the belongings of a very poor people. With much shouting, elbowing, and tumult, the crowd clambered aboard. As there was no baggage car, Roy and Murty must guard their own baggage amid all the confusion of the departure. The engine was of American manufacture, 
but the coaches that tailed along were of crude native construction. The seats were flat boards without springs or cushions of any kind. Riding on them gave an unwilling passenger all the sensations of an electrical vibrating chair. Service on this 40-mile stretch of railroad was just being inaugurated, and the top speed of the train was about 20 miles an hour. Yet, with all the discomforts and primitive conditions, it was still a vast improvement over the wheelbarrow or the sedan chair. At Liling, Chinese riding ponies were waiting to convey the visitors to the little chapel within the walled city, where meetings were conducted with a fine, substantial class of believers. It was a joy to them to hear that beyond the wars and strife of this world, God is preparing a home of peace and security for his faithful people. While at Liling, Roy and Murti visited the large native potteries and were amazed to observe the skill demanded in operating the huge kilns. The Chinese artisans took great pride and pleasure in showing exquisite vases and other creations, many of which required six months or more to perfect. Here was indeed a wonder. Long before Europe or England was able to produce glazed china and delicate pottery, China had perfected this art to a point of rare excellence. It had been a marvel to mariners on trade routes who saw it hundreds of years before America was discovered. On the next lap of their journey, Roy and Murty were persuaded to travel by wheelbarrows, a mode of conveyance which served to rattle their bones far more than the railroad train. After five hours of fearsome jogging and bumping along the rough paths, their spines seemed more like spools strung on a string than the legitimate vertebrae assigned to Homo sapiens. So arrangements were made for sedan chairs, which were a great deal more comfortable. Clothed in its springtime and semi-tropical verdure, much of the country through which they were passing was a scene of surpassing beauty. This reminds me of the song we used to sing at home, Murty said, raising her hand toward the almost unearthly loveliness of the landscape. What is it? asked Roy. There's a land beyond the river. He looked away at the blue of the river, lying like a satin ribbon in the velvet green of the valley, then answered hesitatingly, here is where every prospect pleases, and only man is vile. Then he added, What striking contrasts this country presents. They were passing through a typical native village that appeared utterly diverse from the multicolored patchwork pattern of the cultivated fields in the vicinity. The narrow, dirty streets the pigs, dogs, chickens, and naked children, the squalid, shabby inns and eating places, all were such a contrast to the clear, clean ear and beautiful landscape outside the little town. Murty was amused at the pretentious names of the low hovels which posed as hotels. The Silver Palace, she exclaimed. And here is another, Eternal Peace Restaurant. If the folk at home knew only these names, they'd believe that we missionaries were leading a plush existence. On this trip, they were forced to spend nights at inns with fancy names, but far from fancy accommodations. Smoke, dirt, Insects, filth, poor food, and general squalidness were present at every so-called shelter. 
One night, a heavy, clammy rain and darkness, pressing down early, forced the travelers to seek shelter in a country inn. They were courteously assigned to the only guest room. No soft bed with snowy sheets awaited them. No gleaming bathroom with wonderful hot, cleansing water, generous cakes of soap and clean towels. What pleasure they would have found in even the most primitive of such accommodations. But the so-called guest room had an earthen floor which was far from clean. The walls were of mud, and the one latticed window seemed hermetically sealed so that no breath of air could enter. Possibly a little could filter in through the creases in the ancient tile roof. Well, certainly the air can't come in, but mosquitoes can, Murty ruefully exclaimed, rubbing at the welts caused by the swarms of unwelcome guests. Smoke from the nearby kitchen and from the pipes of other inmates, the smell of frying pork and the heavy odor of unwashed humanity made it a miserable night. The next day, faced without the blessings of much sleep, was filled with a series of thrills and exciting incidents. Reaching the headwaters of a mountain stream, Murty and Roy embarked on a frail little craft with a high rounded bow and stern. To control the current and conserve the flood waters for the rice fields on either side, the natives had constructed a series of dams at intervals of about 100 rods. Each of the dams had a narrow outlet where the stream plunged over a cascade to the lower water level, some four or five feet below. Reaching each of these miniature waterfalls, but Murty didn't consider them so miniature, the passengers would brace themselves and hold their breath. The boatmen would use their pike poles with great strength and deftness, then in a moment, over they would dash. Murty shut her eyes and clung tightly to the boat and to Roy, but she was brave and did not express the fear that she must have felt. Within two hours' time, there were some thirty-five or forty of those ecstatic thrills. How delighted they were to leave the boat that evening. Oh, I'm so glad that's over, Murty whispered, as she got up stiffly to step out of the craft. To be frank with you, I'm glad too, Roy answered. Already, they had begun to wonder how they could retrace their steps on the return journey, or could they arrange to return another way. It was delightful to rest that evening at the outstation of Hui Sien, where they received an enthusiastic welcome. The food was good, and the accommodations were more comfortable than in all of the palaces along the route. The eagerness and delight of the believers, new and old, in greeting the pastor and his wife more than repaid them for all the weariness, hunger, and inconveniences of the trip. The native workers had been diligent, and a large number of them were awaiting baptism. It is the custom in foreign mission fields for the missionary to conduct baptismal classes and to carefully examine the candidates. Evil practices and habits must be given up, for the church would lose its purity if half-converted heathen were indiscriminately allowed to enter the Christian fold. A few days later, a company from this town met on the banks of a picturesque stream, and a group of believers followed their Savior in baptism. The ordinances of the Lord's house were then celebrated, and a new church was organized. Seeing the radiant faces of the new believers brought real happiness to Roy and Murty, for they knew no greater joy than that of winning souls to Christ. This accomplished, 
the boat journey was resumed. Reaching a small town by nightfall, they sought lodging at a native hotel. Can't we have an upstairs room? Roy asked. It would be drier and better for us. Can the foreign lady climb a ladder? Oh yes, Roy assured the innkeeper. Accordingly, they were taken to the loft, where hundreds of horse, cow, and wild animal hides were stored. These were piled high and shoved to one side to make room for the two folding cots. The odor was almost overwhelming, and Mertie held her breath until Roy opened a large window at the far end of the room. Oh, the smell, she cried. At least, Roy answered, it's somewhat better than the floor of Mother Earth. In spite of their surroundings, they slept well. These are the things a missionary must learn to endure, and they were glad that no smell o vision had yet been invented. The next morning, Mertie climbed backward down the ladder, glad to be out of the bedroom in spite of the rest it had afforded them. Roy! Roy! she cried. Look! Oh! Approaching them was the landlord's wife, her long hair in black braids, a sick moaning baby in her arms. Roy! said Bertie. That baby has smallpox. Sure enough, its pathetic little face and arms were liberally covered with horrible, slowing pustules. A missionary needs to be always prepared for the unexpected. As Roy and Mertie climbed into their waiting sedan chairs, they fervently hoped that their last vaccinations would still prove effective. That day, the trail lay over a desert stretch of white sand, and the heat seemed more unbearable than on any other day of their entire lives. Roy thought of the stark day when he had conducted the funeral in Aurora, Illinois, and feared that he would freeze to death, and wondered vaguely how it would seem to be cold again. Because of the intense heat, Murty became very ill. The coolies, struggling with their loads in the broiling sun, sometimes refused to go farther. But with a short rest and the promise of extra pay, they would grudgingly take up their loads and resume the journey. Not long after night had fallen, the little caravan reached a city where there were five hotels, but they were all overflowing. Roy now knew what the verdict, no room in the inn, meant. With Murty ill and the night closing in on them, a place of shelter was urgently needed. In their search, they passed a large, prosperous-looking store. Roy had an inspiration. Bidding the coolies wait, he went into the shop and asked for the proprietor. We're American missionaries, he explained to the courteous gentleman. We've been traveling all day through the great heat, and my wife is ill. We've tried every hotel in town and can find no room. Would you have a place where we might spend the night? Roy always believed that the Holy Spirit led him to this place, for the proprietor answered immediately, Certainly. Come right in. I have a nice guest room for you. The place was a large vegetable oil concern, and one of the employees escorted them through a labyrinth of huge tanks and vats to a quiet room in the rear. It was clean, neat, and looked very inviting to the weary travelers. There was water to drink, and water in which to bathe their fevered bodies. You may open the door for fresh air, they were told. There is a high wall around the place, and there will be no danger of thieves. Opening the door, they found the cool night air very welcome. In the half-light, 
They could see shadows of trees and the trickle of water over an ornamental cascade. After a comfortable restful night, they awoke, refreshed, with morning light and a gentle breeze filling the neat room. Roy brought the ubiquitous lunchbox, and as they were about to open it, a knock came at the door. Now who can that be, Roy thought, going to open it? It was the servant of the proprietor, bearing two huge trees. The odor of delicious food tickled their nostrils, and they decided they had not realized how hungry they were. There were two bowls of rice, fluffy and nut-like, as only the Chinese know how to prepare it. A platter of fried eggs, a bowl of Chinese noodles, and a dish of sweet potatoes. Murty and Roy did a remarkable job of disposing of the well-prepared breakfast so much better than their lunchbox would have provided. How much do we owe you, sir? Roy asked as they were about to leave. Not a thing, the genial host replied. I feel honored to have you Americans as my guests. I hope you rested well and that you could enjoy our Chinese food. I don't know when anything looked or tasted better than that wonderful breakfast, Roy assured him. And we can't thank you enough. Last night my wife was feeling very ill. And how does Madame feel this morning? inquired the gentleman courteously. So much better, Murty told him. I needed a nice cool place to rest and a night of sleep. Again they expressed their deep gratitude and presented to their kind benefactor a New Testament and other gospel literature. Then they made their departure. It was singular that the name of the city, Hisin D, meant New Earth. In all the years that have followed, Roy and Murty have recalled with much gratitude the privilege of having spent one night in the New Earth. A few more hours on a sailboat down the Liai River brought them to the next outstation where they held meetings for several days, conducted a baptism, and organized another church. While at this place, they met a man named Wang, who had become deeply interested in Christianity through reading a tract entitled The Lighted Way, written by Dr. A. C. Selman. Wang and three of his brothers had been keeping the Sabbath for several months, and at this time gladly received baptism. They were happy to become acquainted with the missionaries, and they cordially pressed the invitation. Please come and visit us in our mountain home. We want our family and our neighbors to meet you. Murty and Roy enthusiastically agreed. The mountains looked good after the extreme heat of their journey, and the Wangs translated kings, provided sedan chairs for the trip. Up, up the picturesque wooded trail they climbed to an elevation of 2,500 feet. How different from the agonizing trip across the desert only a few days before. When darkness closed in, they were still on the upward path. Presently, lights appeared ahead a welcome sight. Then, against the sky, the bulky silhouettes of farmhouses and other buildings shone out in relief. Chinese lanterns were waving, dogs were barking, and a large company of wangs came out to welcome the visitors. They were escorted across the courtyard to a clean, comfortable room. Crowds gathered about the door, and stood looking in at the windows. And no wonder, for the Cottrells were the first foreigners ever to set foot on this mountain range. Indeed, few of these people had ever seen a white person in all their lives. Then the Wang, or King brothers, 
began proudly introducing their members of their big family. It was, meet Mrs. King. This is Mr. King. Mr. King or Miss King, until the visitors opened their eyes wide with astonishment. How many Mr. and Mrs. Kings are there? Roy asked. About 900, replied Mr. Wang. That is, in our immediate family. But if we reckon all the families of the one clan on this mountain range, there are nearly 10,000. Murty gasped a little, wondering inwardly at the male confusion if these people ever did get mail. We own this tract of tableland, Mr. Wang continued. It is about seven miles in length and three in width, and scattered here and there are the Wang family villages. The Cotrells then recalled that in most parts of China, no person will marry another bearing the same name. What do you do, Mr. Wang? asked Murty curiously with your young people. I mean, when the time comes for them to marry. Mr. Wang smiled. All of our daughters are exported to other villages and towns in the valley. But the wives for our sons must be imported. Yet this is no trouble. These marriages are all arranged through the services of a middleman whose work is marriage planning. That must be big business here, Murty remarked. There seem to be many young people. Yes, it is, agreed Mr. Wang. Several men have that as their principal life work. Roy smiled to himself, remembering several who would willingly have done such work for him when he was a young bachelor. He could not help being glad that such customs do not prevail in the United States. The Cottrells were then invited to the home of the village chief, one of the men who had just been baptized. The long table, fairly groaned with appetizing Chinese dishes, noodles, eggs, bean sprouts, rice, sweet potatoes, and a delicious white dumpling-like steamed bread. Everything looked and tasted good. Roy and Murty, used to cold inns, biting insects, and discomfort in general, were surprised that under the table a special warmth seemed to be radiating comfort to chilled feet and legs. Roy placed his hand under the table and sure enough, warmth was coming in from somewhere. Where does this heat come from? he asked curiously. It seems to be coming in under the table. It does, replied the host. This room is heated with underground flues. After the meal, the host showed Roy and Murty some elegant pieces of carved furniture. All were treasured heirlooms, each having a history of its own. Several had been made by a grandfather or an old uncle or a great-grandfather. Often, several months were devoted to constructing a single piece. There was great family pride in beauty and accomplishment. You see, remarked Mr. Wang at length, we folk on this mountain are independent and we can produce nearly everything we need, clothing, furniture, food, rugs, cloth, and bedding. Indeed, we buy only salt and the gold leaf we use to gild our furniture. The next morning, Roy and Mr. Wang conducted a large open-air gospel service on one of the threshing floors, and the message was enthusiastically received by the whole clan. Then they, with the elders, sat down to arrange for a mission church school in that area of 10,000 kings. As the Cottrells were taken on a tour of the area, they were made sad to see many images of paganism still occupying conspicuous places. In other homes, picture rolls or Ten Commandment charts had taken the place of the relics of heathenism. 
being royally entertained by the kings of the mountain, had been a noteworthy experience, and one long to be remembered. Now they must leave. Six sturdy kings of the clan carried their sedan chairs down the rugged mountain path so that they could go on to meet their next appointment. The people in the town by the river were waiting eagerly for them. When a posted watcher saw the little procession wending its way down the mountain, other watchers were informed. A quarter of a mile from the city, a well-dressed delegation extended an unusual welcome. As the little caravan halted to exchange greetings, two men carrying a long bamboo pole around which was suspended a bushel or more of firecrackers took their places in front. Two others with similar equipment brought up the rear. What a reception! The leader gave the order, forward march, and the Cottrells were given all the noise and fanfare possible to advertise their entrance into the town. Through the massive old city gates and all along the principal streets, the procession marched, every step punctuated by the sharp staccato explosion of fireworks. Naturally, the little city was astir. From every cross street, lane, and alley poured the curious multitudes, and the two dismayed missionaries found themselves in the midst of an unwelcome demonstration. When the police arrived and demanded the reason for all the excitement, the leader smilingly had his answer ready. Oh, sirs, he cried, King Simu, Mrs. Cottrell, is the first American woman to visit our town. We must give her a royal welcome. That satisfied the officer of the law, who made no further objection. During the Cottrell's four-day visit in this town, excitement ran high. In spite of remonstrance from friends who knew a little of Western customs and etiquette, the visitors had hardly a moment of privacy from dawn to dusk. Hubbling along, limping painfully on tiny bound feet, women came from far and near to see the visitors from abroad. They were watched curiously while they ate. There was free discussion of their appearance, gestures, and motions. Some even removed tile from the roof so that they could obtain a bird's eye view of the foreigners while they slept. As never before, the missionaries sensed the meaning of these words spoken of Christ. As he went, the people thronged him. Perhaps the fanfare and publicity were not wholly evil, though the experience was extremely uncomfortable. It gave favor to the Christian missionaries in the eyes of the people. The Chinese workers in that area had done well in both representing and preaching the gospel. True and loyal disciples of the lowly Jesus were found in that remote little city. Their lives had been transformed. They followed their Lord in baptism, and a church was organized. How glorious it was that amid the gross darkness of paganism, Roy and Murty were able to assist in lighting another candle for the Prince of Light. Early one morning, they committed the little flock into the keeping of the Good Shepherd and chartered an easy-going houseboat for the return trip to their attractive island refuge in Changsha. They were relieved that they need not retrace the hard and rigorous experiences of the route they had just traveled. Settling into their cramped quarters on the small boat, they recalled an old Chinese proverb, travel abroad is always a hardship, but a thousand days at home are peace. Opening their Bibles, they feasted anew upon the wonderful promises. And there, on the swaying little craft, with the sound of rippling, swishing waters ever in their ears, they thanked the Lord for his continued protection 
throughout their long itinerary. They especially rejoiced that the gospel message was taking firm root and that companies like Jets of Light were springing up in many parts of the long closed anti foreign province of Hunan. The end of chapter 13 of Pioneers Together. <laughs>